Okay, so now we're going to talk about elements and principles of design. So really, this is the basic language that interior designers use to convey a meaning or a purpose or a story. So I always like to uh, sort of talk about it as an alphabet. So when you are in preschool or kindergarten, you learn your alphabet. So A, B, C, D, very small little pieces. You don't quite know how to string them into words. And then once you get a little older, now you're learning how to spell words. Then you learn how to spell sentences. Then you learn how to spell paragraphs. So that's exactly the same process um, in design. So the um, design elements that we are going to go through today are the alphabet. So they're just little tiny segments. And then eventually you'll start to put them together into words, put them together into sentences, and then create full stories visually with the support of these elements. So the book that this lecture comes from is by Francis D.K. Ching. And so as you go through the program, you will hear me for sure say, well, remember your Ching terms. And so this is what I'm referring to. Um, the other professors use them. They may not refer to them as Ching terms specifically, but it's really sort of the primary um, elements that we use in design. So if you have the resources and you want to buy this book, it's really a good one and you will use it throughout the um, entire program. So this is Mr. Ching and this is his book. It may look different. This may be an older edition. Um, but when I was in school, this is actually a book that I purchased as well. So the first primary element is point. So how I like to describe point is if you have a little pebble and you're holding it in your um, fingers, right? So just a little tiny pebble. And so again, some of these things are not um, tangible things. So technically a point is not tangible. It's not a real element. It's sort of imaginary. So once I actually have a pebble, it, it then becomes a sphere, which is no longer a point. Before the purposes of just sort of imagining points, we're gonna say a little pebble or a little tiny marble. Okay, so it, it, a point um, indicates a place in space. So here on the tip of our pencil, we can see the points um, in this starfish. Um, there are kind of lots of points, right? So I could have a point that's happening right in the center, but around each one of the te tentacles um, is also points or are also points. So we see point in design and architecture. I think this is a really good example. When I look up to the top of this stair, I see a point um, that then has an opening around it, but then is also sort of centralized to the spiral stair that's going around. Um, here I have a window that's sort of mimicking a um, fan wheel that is centered on a point. The second primary element is line. So how I like to describe line is that if I dropped my pebble in the sand and then pulled it all the way through the sand, it would create a line. So the official definition of line is a point extended. So the official definition of line is a point extended. And a lot lines can vary, right? They can be thick, they can be thin, they can be dashed, they can be curvy, they can be diagonal, um, they can be dotted. Um, lines show contour and shape. So I can have a single line that outlines something and it's immediately recognizable like this elephant, right? But the reality is if I look at it in truth, it's truly just a line. Um, I can have sketchy lines that talk about freeform movement. I can have lines that start to contour. So I can see very clearly that this is a hand, but the reality is it's just lines on paper. I can have lines that um, sort of define shape like this one. So there's not a line that actually outlines this S, but because of the lines are stopping and starting, the area that's a void with outline is starting to create a separate shape. We see lines in nature all the time. So we see lines in spider webs, we see lines in the sides of mountains, we see lines consistently, um, trees. If you look in nature, you will see lines all around you. 
So here are some lines using architecture, um, lines of light, again, absolutely beautiful. So again, as designers, we're, we're um, charged with doing things in a way that is different and unique. So again, who's to say that lighting, and we saw lighting in our last lecture, can't really be an harmonious part of the design as it starts to talk about line. Here, um, again, we have texture that's happening in our walls. So instead of having just big blank walls, these lines have been introduced and we have up lighting. Beautiful, right? So here's a space that really is without any form of traditional wall, except for maybe the outside shell. What's defining the space is just a series of lines that are moving through the ceiling down to the floor, um, creating arches and creating a lot of movement. Um, lines, looks like a library of some sort. But again, I have the books down here, but those lines are carried all the way up. Um, isn't that beautiful? And then it sort of disappears into this coved lighting ceiling. This, I'm not sure what it is. It's lovely. It looks like a cathedral of some kind, or for sure when we go back to our Gothic architectural style, it's definitely in sort of a Gothic style. Um, but again, all made of lines. So we're really just seeing the skeletal system um, of the design ideas of Gothic. Plane. So plane is our next element. So how I now describe plane is you have a line, right? And so now sort of like a um, accordion door or a shade that you're going to bring down, a, a plane is a line extended. So first we have point and I dropped my point in my sand and I pulled it. So a point is a line extended, excuse me, a line is a point extended. And now I have my line and I'm pulling it out. And so now a line, a plane, is a line extended. So I'm going to do that one more time because I'm going to confuse you. So our first element was point. I drop it in the sand. I extend it. It becomes a line. So a line is a point extended. Now I have my line, and like a shade, I'm pulling it down. So a plane is a line extended. So here are some planes um, that we're seeing that are, have been outlined. So you can sort of see these curved planes are really creating space. And then we filled in the spaces in between so people can inhabit them. Again, beautiful examples of planes. This one that has some color that's been applied to the bottom. But really, when I look at this, it's just planes that are layered. And so we'll talk about layered as a definition as well, or an element. And then again, more layers, really beautiful. Um, again, this is just a single plane. So when I look at this white piece, it feels like it could truly just be a bended or bent piece of paper, right? And then the voids again are filled in and this is where I inhabit. So, but still this whole building really just made up of one single plane. Uh, then I have this one, again, one single plane that's being bent to create space. Here's another one. So we can see it's just a plane that's being bent around onto itself. Another beautiful example of planes. Okay, so we can also start to understand that um, I can create spaces without using planes. So this is an example of line to plane. So if I have a lot of lines that are sort of at a regular interval, or somehow I see a pattern happening in there, um, my mind starts to say, hmm, that's a plane. So I know on one side of those lines is one space, on the other side of the lines is another space. So when I'm looking at my swans here, or geese, swans, geese, I'm not sure, but I'm looking at my birds, um, I know for sure that in this area um, is, is one area. On the other side is another area. So these lines are, are creating a plane. When I look at these lines in this piece of art, I know for sure that over here is where I'm not supposed to be, right? It becomes a different space as opposed to here is the gallery. 
So lines becoming planes. Um, so here we have a stairwell where instead of having a solid wall, um, they've created these lines that go up and act as the wall, but then they also bend and act as a ceiling. Okay, so line to plane. I do believe this is uh, the interior of a building of some sort. Um, they're really cool. So these lines are twisting into what? A point. So this is where, so, so all of the images I'm showing you are really sort of paragraphs. Um, like we talked about in the beginning, there's um, the alphabet, then words, then paragraphs. So in all of these images, you'll see multiple um, Qing terms used. Um, so I think they're all lovely. And this one in particular is talking about movement. And as we go through, we'll talk about movement. It's talking about point. It's talking about line. Um, so all of the elements begin to stack on each other. So here's another line to plane in that back wall. And then we also see just regular planes um, sort of waving or undulating at the top as the ceiling. So our next um, element we're going to talk about is shape. So shape, our shape is really basic. So uh, again, when you were in kindergarten, you learned about squares, triangles, stars, hearts, diamonds. So those are shapes. They're flat. They're two-dimensional. As we start to get a little bit more um, elevated in our speaking about shape, shape is really um, still flat, but the outline of something. So you can still know very clearly with what something is just by looking at its shape. So we know that this is a little girl blowing these dandelions. Um, there's no detail. We just know that from her shape. Kitty cats looking at us were very clear because of their shape. These are all chairs. I'm not seeing any detail. I'm not seeing any three-dimensional elements. I'm not seeing any shade and shadow. I'm only seeing the two-dimensional shape of these chairs, but I'm very clear. I can even name um, some of the um, designers for these chairs. I could name the type of chairs. So on the opposite side of shape is volume. So if I were to say square is the shape, cube would be the volume. If circle is the shape, a sphere is the volume. If triangle is the shape, a pyramid is the volume. So now volume is actually the three-dimensional item, so I'm starting to understand that this thing has more than one side. So you could also say that a volume is now a plane extended. So I'm taking my plane and I'm pulling it forward and I'm creating something that's three-dimensional. So here's the comparison. So shapes, again, flat. They have no um, dimension, whereas volumes have dimension. So here's another. So this is the chair. One of the chairs that we saw, so there's the shape of the chair versus the volume. So again, we're starting to put all of these alphabets together to form words. So if I were to look at this, they are all definitely volumes, but I could even say that these are line to volume, right? We saw a line to plane, but now this is line to volume because really I could stick my finger in there, right? So it's not a solid thing, but I can. Um, not get into that shape so or that volume. So it's aligned to volume, but all definitely, all definitely volumes. So here's some other volumes, um, chairs and tables. Volume, again, a big shape that's taking up space, the volume. And then transformation of form. So transformation of form is really a fun one, especially to look at in interiors and architecture, um, because it tells a story. And as designers, that's what we are aiming to do, to tell a story in a space or to draw your attention to something. So what's important about transformation of form is that there are little changes that happen um, until eventually your form is different. So if you've ever done one of those flip books where you go, and it looks like the cartoon is moving, it's the same sort of ideas. Like each picture is just slightly different, 
but when you flip it, it makes the whole um, image look as if it's moving. So it's the same idea. I have a shape and then it's get gradually changing until it becomes a totally different form. So um, on the bottom, this is sort of a graphic image where this is a Panton chair, relatively famous mid-century modern chair that's slowly, gradually changing into an S. Um, in this building, I feel like I have a wave, right, that's coming up and down. And that's because these panels are gradually changing um, going a little higher and a little taller and then back down and a little higher and a little taller. So there's a transformation of form that's happening. So here I feel like I have these planes, right, that are sort of dripping down into the space and that's because they're gradually changing as they go. Subtractive form. So subtractive form is when you take a chunk out of an object, but your mind wants to put it back. So in each of these cases at the bottom, I know they're all cubes. My mind is like they're cubes. Just happens to be a cube with another cube missing or happens to be a cube with a um, cylindrical shape missing. Um, so it's, it's a chunk out of something, but your mind still knows what the original element was. So it's a subtraction um, from a form, so subtractive form. So here's some examples of that. So I'm very clear that this at one point was solid and that they've subtracted this space out. Again, all of the lines are there. I know this was a rectangle, but they've chunked this out and they've chunked this out. So subtractive form. This is cool subtractive form, right? So obviously a cube, but somehow they've sort of melted these pieces away. So it's starting to look a little bit more like a Swiss cheese. Subtractive form can happen on the interior of a space as well. So these are sections. So sort of like a dollhouse, they cut through a building and they opened it up. Um, but what I'm seeing is like this section has been pulled out of this space. So, and, and the reason why I feel as if it's this is, is pulled out is because when I look at everything else, it's very straight and angular, right? So I have these straight lines that are happening all throughout this building space, but then this centerpiece is very curved. So it feels different than the rest. So this one is also using contrast um, and hierarchy, which we will talk about as we go. Um, we have additive form, which is the opposite of um, subtractive, right? So now I'm putting things together. And so there are different ways you can put things together. So edge to edge means I'm just taking the edges and they're very nicely coexisting right on the edge together. Could be face to face, which means one face of an object is right on the, another face of an object or a side um, or interlocking, meaning that they're actually somehow joining together. So additive form can happen in many different ways. It can be edge to edge, face to face, or interlocking. So here are some additive forms. This one looks pretty face to face, right? Pretty nice, tidy things happening together. This one looks interlocking. So these house shaped forms are stacking on each other, but they're sort of also melting into each other. So they're interlocking. Um, this tall building is face to face face-to-face. -face. So things just looking like they're stacking in a nice, easy, and comfortable way. So here's some more additive form. More additive form. And then we have centralized forms. So centralized forms means that things are centered on a point, so there's always something happening in the center. And the elements that are happening are moving into that point. So it's off facing or focused on or moving into the center of the space. So centralized form is it's organized by a point that's in the center and things are moving in and towards that center. So when I look at this, it's very much um, cohesive and moving into the center. Um, all of these things cohesive moving into the center and this one I could argue and we'll see we'll see what's coming next and I will understand why I'm why I'm going to argue with that one so centralized all of these petals sort of moving in and around 
um, tables, living rooms are a good example of centralized organization um, because there's a table and things are organized around it, um, centralized form. And then radio. So radio, it, radio is different than centralized because I still have that point, but now instead of things coming together, they're radiating out. So from my point, I have things that are moving away from it. So they're starting at the point and moving out. As opposed to centralized, they're moving in. So you're feeling a little safer. You're feeling more protected in centralized. In radio, you're sort of feeling more spun out. You want to go to the ends um, of the organization as opposed to staying in the center. So there are things that flip you out. So when I look at this, this is definitely like a whoosh. So there is still a center point that's happening there, but things are moving out in an outward way as opposed to an inward way. So here's some more radio. So again, the movement is out as opposed to in. Out as opposed to in. And then we have clustered form. So we saw additive. And additive is very similar to clustered, except clustered doesn't have as much rhyme or reason. Typically, clustered looks like, like you have some trash on your desk. You're sort of pushing it all together and moving it. So clustered tends to be less organized. So here is clustered form. And it, I should say it feels less organized. I'm sure all of these designers and architects had a rhyme or reason as to why everything is exactly where it is. But for the viewer, it feels less organized. So clustered forms. And the shapes tend to be different. They look a little more haphazard. So here's grid. Um, so grid is a series of lines that intersect, that create points. So here's a, a building based on a grid, and actually there are multiple grids that are happening. The Getty, if you've ever been, is a master grid. It's absolutely beautiful in perfection. Um, so if you are standing at this building, we'll say, so first of all, let's even just look at the building. So I see that this grid is exactly the same grid as what's happening in the windows. And then when I take these four squares, that line is a perfect um, alignment with what's happening on this um, overhang. And so this is another grid system that's happening. So this is also modular, which we'll talk about. But what's really impressive about the Getty Center is that if I took this line and I followed it down all the way to the floor, it would meet another line that would continue all the way over to the floor, all the way to the next building, up the next building and then onto the um, roof or ceiling of the building across the courtyard. So the, the Getty, the whole entire um, complex is based on a single grid and all of the buildings connect, which I think is really impressive. So here's some other grids. So grids do not have to be boring. So this is typically how we think of a grid, right? But a grid could also be at an angle and start to create diamond shapes. Another grid happening in the ceiling. Grid happening on the wall, which I think is really cool. So a grid doesn't have to be square, it could be triangles, as long as it's regular um, lines creating a pattern of points. So more grid. And that is the end of part one. So I will see you in part two, hopefully soon.